It's been a while. I'm sorry, I may be a little nervous. Let's open up in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you this morning for this kind of cool breeze that seems to be going through this church. And it's not as hot and it's dry as the land has been so wet from all the rains this morning. You have sunshine and warmth. I pray, Father, that as we go through your word, that our hearts are open and our ears are open to your message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Many of you remember back in the mid-90s, early millennium part, uh, the housing craze, the real estate market. What people were doing, they were buying these old-type homes and buildings and renovating them. Obviously, some people were doing it properly, but the majority of the people, what they were doing is they were buying these old buildings falling apart, slapping on a little bit of paint, putting on a little bit of siding, dressing it up to make it look good enough and selling it for top dollar. I don't know about the Canadian market, but I know it was a big deal in the United States. And when people were buying these homes, they were buying homes that were rat infested, cockroach infested. They were falling apart to find out that all the money they poured into this house they thought was in great shape was going to cost them a lot more to renovate it properly in order for them to live in. And this morning in 1 John, I'd like to go through the phases of our faith as we grow in our Christian life. And John begins in John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse, or sorry, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. He gives us key words to this entire book that just kind of pop out to us as we're reading them. Such words are like born of God. Uh, 1 John 2, 3, and 4. If you turn to that, please. John goes on to say, We know that you have come to know him if you obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, and does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And Jesus himself even tells us this in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. He says, Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And if we claim to know him, uh, he should be the first priority in our life. And many Christians today, what we do is we come to know Christ, and then he seems to take a second seat, a back seat. And John addresses us here saying that if we know him, we know him, the truth lives within us, and we obey his commands. And the biggest command, as Jesus told us, is to love the Lord God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our souls. He's to take number one priority over everything in our life. It doesn't matter what it is that we're doing, even with our families. And then First John verses 5 and 6 in chapter 2, he goes on to say, but if anyone who obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how you know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, he must walk as Jesus did. And how did Jesus walk? And the scripture gives us examples in the New Testaments and the four Gospels that Jesus didn't just sit passive teaching in a synagogue or waiting for people to come to him. He was actually out there. He was healing the sick. He was feeding poor people. He was actually giving a listening ear to those who needed someone to come and talk to. And he was able to minister to their spirit through that and help them understand who he was truly. Mark 1 uh, chap, uh, book, the book of Mark, chapter 1, 35. It gives us an example how Jesus was able to do a lot of this stuff. And these are examples that we should be taking. It says here, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and he went off to a solitary place. And then he prayed. And that's the example that we need to be giving ourselves. This morning, if we ask ourselves, are we of God? Are we born of God? Do we do that? Do we get up early in the morning, no matter how busy our schedules are? Do we set time for 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is? Do we give God the first part of our day? And when we go to bed, is he the last thing that goes through our mind? Is he what we think about throughout the day as we're going through whatever we are? Are we thanking him for the good things that are happening? And if we're having some serious difficulties, are we asking him to help us through whatever we're going through? And then the second key phrase in 1 John we read is in John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And John uses a key phrase here 
And it says here that as if we claim. John 1, 5 through 10 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in light, he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sins. If we claim to be without sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim to have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. It's just like those people who were buying these homes and then just masking the problems. And they were liars. They never renovated the building properly. All they did was spend very little to, send it, to, to sell it for a lot and lie to the people saying that what they were getting was brand new. Uh, it's one of the things I was actually impressed at renting from where I rent. Our landlords didn't cut no corners. They bought this building when we did the roof. I was, at first thing that went through my mind is, why would you spend money on a building like this, tear it down? But they took time and they spent money and they renovated the building. They were not liars. In the end, that building is brand new. I'm impressed how they did that. And they took pride in what they had. And that's what happens with us in our Christian faith. You know, first we come and claim that we know the Lord, we come to church on Sundays, and then when we walk out Monday to Saturday, what comes from our mouths? We have profanities coming from our mouths. Uh, one of the things I found interesting uh, the other day, I'm coming into Leamington, and I was going into town to the bank, and I was at a red light, light turned green. A car was supposed to come forward. They had to ride away, and they kind of hesitated a little bit. Well, someone behind me was honking the horn like crazy. And the car at the light must have heard because they caught their attention, and they went through the light properly, and I made my turn. Well, that person could not be patient, they passed me right in town. Well, I thought it was very funny because they passed me, not two seconds later, they pulled into the bank, the same bank I was pulling into. You know, <laughs> and you can see the look on their face and what was coming out of their mouth. I'm glad the window wasn't open because I didn't think I wanted to hear what they were saying. They were not being pleasant in any way, shape, or form. And instead of looking at me and saying, I'm sorry for being impatient, they put their head down and ran right inside the bank, did what they had to do, and ran right out. Two seconds, two seconds. You know, we claim to be Christians. How are we being changed? Are we still being the same as we were when we came to know Christ? Or are we different years later? Uh, you know, when we get into now the part of the Scripture that I'm going to be talking to us about this morning, John is addressing that. Uh, John 1, uh, 1 John 2, 4, 12 to 14. Here John begins to tackle our, uh, how would I say, our stages in our spiritual walk. He says to us here, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. And what John is doing here, he classifies us in three different stages. First, he talks to children. Children are born. When we come to know Christ, the Bible tells us we are born again. Then he talks to, to fathers. Fathers are mature in their age. They're people that you go to get wisdom from. They have understanding. They've been through it all. They know how to deal with circumstances, and they know how to help you. And he talks to young men or young women. Uh, we've got to understand the Bible is not being gender-specific here. It's just the term it's using within the church body. It's men and women uh, the, in the same category. Uh, young men are those who are young in the faith, who are growing, and they're learning to overcome things in their life. As he goes through all of this, uh, John uses these terms to remind us that growing in our faith is just like growing in our physical beings. In the Bible, in the entire New Testament in the Bible, 
gives us a lot of examples. Here's a few examples. If you're taking notes, I'm going to be a little quick with these. 2 Thessalonians 1.3. It says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love everyone has for you and each other is increasing. Ephesians 4.15. He says, Instead of speaking the truth, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into who is the head that is Christ. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Like new more babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. 2 Peter 3.18. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you still need more convincing, here's one more scripture verse, Hebrews 6, one. Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on into maturity. The Bible says when we get born again, we became infants in Christ, we crave the spiritual milk. Just like a little infant requires milk in order to grow our formula. We're the same way in the spiritual realm. When we get born again, we require the spiritual truth of God's word, which is the milk of the word, the Bible says. And it helps us to begin to grow and crave more. And through that understanding, we begin to see where we are and who God really is. Uh, a little, uh, as little children, we're known for our fellowship with our father. Why is that? Because a little child depends on its parents. It trusts its parents. Anything you say to them is truth to them because they don't know any better. And as they get older, they begin to realize, yes, it is what you're saying is true. And that's when he, he writes to us, he says, he writes to us as, uh, I write to you little children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. What's one of the biggest things that happens when we come to know Christ? Our sins are forgiven. That's the first thing that happens to us when we get saved. And how do we know that? Just because somebody tells us this? Well, the Bible tells us it's because when we're born again, our spirit changes. We're born. It's a birth spiritually in ourselves. And when we're born, we begin to realize there's different things out there that we've never seen, right and wrong. As a little infant, we used to think that kicking somebody or hitting somebody to get back at them was a good thing, right? Payback. As we get older, we recognize that's wrong. And who tells us it's wrong? Well, unfortunately, today, society doesn't seem to do that anymore. But in the spiritual realm, when we do something wrong, there's something that tells our spirit from within that says, that's wrong, don't do it, you need to deal with it, and you move forward. I heard a man once say that they went on a vacation to the East Coast, and it was actually a very beautiful town, and he knew of someone famous that was born there, and uh, he, the way he came out, he said to a, a, one of the town people, he said, uh, has there ever been anybody famous or was anyone born famous here in this town? And the man looked at him and he says, no, just babies have been born. Here, you know, it's basically it, right? Babies have been born. It's the same thing in the faith. When we're born, we're born into the faith. And that's how John addresses us. He addresses us as little children to begin that. And in uh, John 3, 5, and 7, Jesus himself tells us that we have to be born of the Spirit and baptized to enter the kingdom of heaven. And as children, we can never never enter the unless we're like children we can never enter the kingdom of heaven and why is that because as adults when we come to the faith as adults sometimes if we don't uh, change our thinking we've got things that we bring with us that you know we try to reason everything but as a child a child doesn't reason it believes it understands it learns and it moves forward and it's the same thing with us in the faith we trust God when we're born again and we move forward with him when he tells us, this is wrong, this is what you need to do, and you understand it. You know, I had to really reflect back when I came to know Christ 13 years ago. One of the biggest things that I found amazing was this. Not only my sins were forgiven, God called me a friend. Believe that? You know, I used to use, you know, curse words were a big thing in my vocabulary back then. And... God's name to me was just known as some, uh, a way to express disgust. Instead of using a four-letter word, I would use God's name instead. But when I came to know him, God forgave me, and he actually helped me understand that. 
you know, one of the biggest things is uh, when we get saved, fear starts to go away from us. Romans 8, 15 and 16 tells us, he says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And one of the things that I, today, I still find very difficult, I can call him dad. You know, you call your father the one who gave you birth, dad. And ironically enough, I remember a time uh, talking to a friend of mine who uh, married, and the lady he married had a young child. And he he adopted that child. She took uh, his name, and they became part of the family. And one of the things, you know, one day I, I was talking with him, and he was kind of quiet. And usually he's always cheerful and joking around. And I said to him, what's up? He says, well, we had told, uh, you know, so-and-so that they were adopted. And I said, oh. I said, uh, okay, how did that go? He says, well, I was a little surprised. He said, they came and hugged me and said, you're the only dad we've ever known. I thought that was pretty neat. That's the type of adoption we have when we get saved. God becomes the only father we've ever known because we can call him father. And he even tells us that. He is our father. And with relationship comes growth. And God never designed us to uh, just to grow physically. He also designed us to grow spiritually. We can't stay where we are. An infant that does not feed and grow dies. It's as easy as that. It cannot sustain any nutrition. It doesn't go any further in life. And it's the same truth for us spiritually. 1 Corinthians 13.11 says, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I put all childish behaviors behind me. 1 Peter 2.2 says, Like newborn babies were to crave the pure milk of the Spirit so that by it we grow up in our salvation. You know, we have to grow up in our salvation. Uh, have you ever seen children that pull tenter, uh, tenter, uh, temper tantrums in grocery stores? I feel sorry for their moms. They're sitting there and they want something, and the mom says no, and they start freaking out and run in front of everybody. And sometimes that happens with newborn Christians who really never grew up in the faith, and they would have these same temper tantrums. And John says, you can't do that. You've come to know him. You know who he is. Let's move on. Let's move forward. You have to start craving the spiritual things of God. In Ephesians 4.14, he says, uh, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftsness of men and deceitful schemings. Well, what's that mean? He says, you know, as babies, when we first come to Christ, we have tendencies to be willing to learn, and sometimes we listen to the wrong people. But when we crave the pure spiritual milk of God, we get to read His truth and start to understand it. And people around us who we know know the Lord start helping us through these spiritual discernments, you can say. These people who come to deceive you, we understand that they're wrong. And it's sad to say many of these spiritual babes have fallen victim to cults like the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and then there's many more out there that do that because they love to feed on these young people who are very, very open to the Word of God. And when they're alone, they don't know how to stand for the truth, and they have no one supporting them, and they wind up going part part of their followings whatever that is, and that's sad to see that happening. And finally, you have John 13 and 14. Now John begins, uh, or sorry, uh, we have John 13 and 14, it's not finally, it's now he's, a t- he's talking to young men. And God for, uh, John here writes, he writes first to children, then he's writing to fathers, then he's writing to young men. I didn't follow that order because I wanted to kind of go through just like in our physical 
changes. We grow from children to young people, adults, to older people. I'm doing the same thing here. And John begins to talk to young men. He says here, you know, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And that's pretty interesting. Why have we overcome the evil one? Because as children, we become Christians, and we don't know much, and we're learning, and we're moving forward. But when we progress to the stages of young men, we begin to do battle. And how many of us know that as children, there's a thing called justification. We've been justified right with God, and God helps us understand that because we have been forgiven of our sins. The thing that follows next is sanctification. And sanctification is being made holy. Well, that's the next step in our spiritual walk. As children, we've been justified, and God helps us understand that we have been forgiven for all the wrongs we've done. And as young men, God begins to help us understand we need to start taking on the image of Christ because that's our ultimate goal in the end. So we begin to do battles. And what are the battles? Well, I know for myself, things that I thought I had dealt with years ago when I came to Christ seem to come up today, 13 years later, and I sit there thinking to myself, you know, Lord, I thought I dealt with this. And God reminds me, you didn't deal with this. All you did is you pushed it to the side, you moved on, and now I'm bringing you back to it because who are you when you're alone? Pastor Mike had asked that a long time ago in a message. He says, who are we when we're alone? And that's a good question to ask all of us. If we're not just young people, if we're young in the faith, we've moved on from the infancy stage, who are we? When we're around unbelievers, what comes from our mouth? Are we always looking for opportunities to share the gospel? Or are we just living our life for ourselves? Uh, you know, when someone cuts us off, do we flip something to them and drive on all in anger? When someone says something that we don't like, are we taking it to the next level and freaking out? Uh, are, we, uh, are we taking the time to know what's important? Paul writes in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy, he says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now, we've got to remember, when God talks about lust, lust isn't always a sexual thing. It could also be monetary, possessions, what do we lust after? Is God the sole purpose in our life so we can move forward and he provides what we need? Or are we looking at, I want more things. The bigger house, the fastest sports car, the nicest car. Are we looking for, well, I've got this much money, I'd like to double that. And then I do whatever it takes to step on or do whatever I need to do to make it work. Uh, I've heard it say by people that, you know, it's business. I'm okay with that, but business doesn't mean you hurt people around you in order to succeed. And Paul is saying we need to flee from youthful lusts. And these are the things that begin to work within us as we're growing in the faith. We come out of babes, we go to young men or women, and we begin to struggle with these things. Looks, is looks a big thing? Today we watch TV and it's all about the hair and about the makeup and about the clothes and it's about the most expensive purses and shoes and you name it. And that's what society has come down to. It's having the best of the best and not worrying about how you're getting it. And we're being told to start to go away from that, to get away from that. And when we become born again Christians, you know, how, many, uh, how many of us know that when we're saved and we get we go into the infancy stage and we move to the young person stage. All the luggage we had when we came to know Christ comes with us. And I don't know, I know some people have had to go through hard times. And I think the hardest thing is sometimes is to forgive. And, you know, that's a big struggle for me today myself. Someone does me wrong, you know, I want to dwell on that and tell everybody around me what I, you know, what's been done. Or do we forgive them? Like the Bible says, you know, Forgive him. Let it go. God will deal with that person on his time. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Not my own. It's the Lord's. And that's one of the things as young men we begin to realize that 
sometimes we just have to step back and say, all right, God will deal with it. Let's keep moving forward. Let's not dwell on the past. It's not going to change anything. I can't change tomorrow, but I can change today and move forward into the future with God's help. And the Bible tells us to do that. In uh, Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as, a, as, a, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Well, how do we do that? Well, as young men, we begin to learn how to cultivate the relationship with Christ. We begin to figure out when we can do our devotions, when we can take time to talk to the Lord, how we talk to the Lord, who we talk to to help us through our growth. You know, how do we... How do we know God more intimately? What does God want in my life? And sometimes these are realities we have to face as we're going through problems, and we have to sit back and say, okay, what do you want from me, Lord? And who do you talk to? As young men, I challenge you, do you or, or young people in the faith, I should say, if we're young in the faith, do we have someone that we can go to and talk to to get mentored? If not, why? There's nothing embarrassing about it. If we want to grow, how do we grow? You know, in, in the business realm, they say that you imitate those who are successful. What happens? You become successful. Well, in the Christian realm, we imitate those who are in the faith, who move forward in the faith. We see what they do, and we begin to imitate that because that's what the Bible tells us to do. We don't just sit there and wait. Hebrews tells us that it's the meat of the word. Psalms explains it as the secret of purity if we hide it in our hearts. Ephesians says it's the sword of the Spirit that helps defend ourselves in battle. If we remember Jesus, what happened there? You know, how did Jesus you know, realize Jesus is God? But he gave us the best example ever. He led by how he wanted us to live. Remember what happens after he was led into the desert? He was tempted three times. And do we know how he defeated the devil? He gave him scriptural truth. He didn't do nothing else. He just said, it's written, it's written, it's written. And that speaks to me. is like, how would I know that if I'm not in the Word, if I'm not learning it, if I'm not taking it in, to start hiding it in my heart, as the psalmist says. And the only way we do battle as, script, as, as Christians is through the Word of God. We don't go beat anybody up. We don't take revenge and retaliation in any way. The Bible gives us clear advice that we are to put on the full armor of God and we're to stand firm even though we can't do anything else. When there's nothing more we can do, we stand. Why? Because it's in faith. We know God will do the battle. And then, you know, it, it goes on to help us understand, too, that through all of this, we begin to influence those around us. You know, you have unbelievers that we work with all the time. We may have them as partners in a business. We may have them in our families. There are many families here that, you know, we're, Christ, we're saved. We know the Lord, but we've got fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles that if they were to drop that dead today, that, you know, it's sad to say that they would come before the Lord and judgment, not for rewards. And how do we influence them? Do we try to encourage them? Do we lend an ear to them? Are we there as a listening device sometimes that they should know that if there's anything that they're going through, can they call up on us? Can they say, hey, I need someone to talk to? And then it just stays between you and them. Do you pray for them? You know, I was asked that today, uh, not today, this week. Are you praying for so-and-so? Are you really praying for them? Hmm. You know, sure helps us think what we're doing when we're talking about people who don't know Christ. Are we really praying for them? And if we really care for them, as young men, we're learning not to just defeat the evil one in battle through the Lord and help us understand that we have weaknesses that we need to deal with and we need to take up the sword of the Spirit but we need to be there for others so that as an example to them. Because, again, we're growing in our faith. 
And now John begins to talk to fathers. That is the ultimate goal for every Christian. We're to mature in our faith so that we can move forward and press on towards the goal. First, John talks to us as children. Then John talks to us as young men. And now John's talking to us as fathers, as spiritual leaders within our church body and in our families and homes, even in our workplaces. And why does he call us fathers? He says, I have written to you because you have known him from the beginning. Known who from the beginning? As an infant, we knew God from the beginning because he forgave us. He justified us. As a young man, he sanctified us. He helped us grow forward in our faith. We've begun that sanctification process, so now whatever has been impure in our lives, whatever it is that a person is struggling with or been trying to deal with, he's helped us move forward to become a father because when we look back, we can tell our children or people who are around us or friends, co-workers, God is real. Why? Because I went through this. This is what God did for me. Or so-and-so was going through this, and through this whole process, God did this. You know, we can explain it any way we want, but folks, when something disastrous happens in our life, if we don't know Christ, usually we try to compensate with whatever it is. Some people use drugs. Other people go to alcohol. Other people become gamblers. Other people just step back, and they shy away from everybody. They don't talk to anyone. They go through a serious depression stage. But those who know Christ, the Bible tells us we mourn for a season. Whatever that disaster is, we mourn for a season. But we know that he's got us, he's carrying us through it, and he's helping us through it. And what does God do? He brings people all around you to help comfort you and help you through that problem. You know, one of the neatest things is when you go into a problem and a friend calls up and says, oh, these days they text. (laughs) They text you up, text you and say, I'm thinking about you and we're praying. That is so neat. That is so neat. It speaks volumes. And as fathers, you know, we have that experience. That's one of the best resources that we have on our side. We've gone through it. So we can help the infants in the faith understand why God is who God is. And as young men, we can help them go through whatever ordeal that they're going through. But one of the biggest problems we have to understand here as As uh, Christians, sometimes we get complacent as fathers. We get comfortable in what we're doing. We don't want to do no more. We've done it all, right? Uh, God helped me to remember that Noah was 120, I believe, when he built the ark. uh, Abraham was 100 years old when he had his first or second child, actually. It was Sarah's first. And we take a look at Moses. The Bible says at 120, he still had his eyesight and his strength. At 80, God used him to lead the Israelites into the wilderness. And so on and so on. There's many more in Scripture that we can go through, but I don't have that much time this morning for that. One of the biggest things as fathers, we become mature in the faith. And not only we're mature in the faith, we become leaders. Leaders in our church, leaders in our homes, leaders in our workplace. And, you know, many people who, who get to that standing understand that it doesn't matter what happens. God is in control. It's the easiest thing, you know. God will take care of it, right? I don't know how many times I've heard <coughs> older men in the faith say to me, you know, oh, it's okay. You're worrying too much. Stop stressing out. It comes. It comes. Don't worry about it. And you sit back and you look at it and you see a pattern. There's mountaintops and then there's low valleys. And they've been through all that, and they've recognized over time that it doesn't matter how high the mountaintop is, you're going to go through that valley, but then you're going to go back up to the mountaintop, and you're going to go back down in the valley. And that cycle just continues on, continues on, but it's faith that carries us through it. The Bible says faith is something that is not seen, but we believe in it anyways. Paul tells us in Philippians 3.12, he says, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold for me. 
who press on towards a salvation. Paul says it's like a runner who's running a race. He does not stop. He goes forward right to the end. Whether you're in first place or not, you're running right to the end. In your own mind, you're going to get the prize at the end. And that's how we're supposed to always be. We're never to be complacent. We're never to sit back and just say, ah, somebody else will do it. Oh, I've, I've done it all. I don't need to do it anymore. Let somebody else take care of it. We're to step up and show that we are moving forward in our race. And we're not growing complacent in any way, shape, or form in our faith. And now this morning, you know, we've tackled the spiritual babes, the young men, and then the spiritual fathers. And I don't know where everybody is at in their stages in here this morning. If you're at the spiritual level still, where you've come to know Christ and you're still growing, I recommend you crave the Word of God. That's what it calls it. It's a spiritual milk. Talk to somebody that you know, that you see them imitating Christ. Help them help you develop uh, a devotion plan. Sometimes you can buy devotionals. Or have you come to Christ three, four years ago and you're still in the same spot that you were three, four years ago? Has anything changed in your life? I don't know. As young men, what are you struggling with? Or young people in the faith, men and women, what are you struggling with? What are the struggles that God is helping you try to work through right now that you know you need Him to work through it? And only through the Word of God that we embed in our hearts, He can help us through whatever struggles we're going through. And as fathers, have we grown complacent? Have we figured, you know, we've done enough, we don't need to do no more? If we've been in the faith that long, are we leaders? Are we mentoring? You know, that's one of the things that I have to start looking at myself because there's a lot of young people in our church, and I'm impressed that there's more young people on this side than everywhere else in the church. And, you know, it's, it's a neat thing to see them grow. Are we taking the time to get to know them and to invest in their life as spiritual fathers? Or have you never accepted Christ as your Savior this morning? If not, I invite you to do that. Why? The Bible says that if we die without Christ, we perish. God doesn't give us any other example. If we die in our sins, we're dead. But if we're quick and just to repent from our sins and accept Him as our Lord and Savior, the Bible says we have been justified through Him, through the blood of Christ, and made right with Him. And this morning, I invite you to do that if you haven't done that. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your word. It cuts like a two-edged sword. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard to hear some things that are said because it speaks to us as if we're looking in a mirror and we're seeing our reflections. Lord, this morning I pray that you touch everyone's heart and that you would give grace to those who need it and those who have been in the faith for a while, that they would move forward in their faith and be challenged by it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, the hymn song this morning is found in your books, 183. It's beneath the cross of Jesus. <laughs>